working through the first creation story. As you know, there are two complementary creation stories in the book of Genesis. First one goes from chapter 1, verse 1, to chapter 2, verse 4. So I'd like to read it to you kind of verse at a time and then start to unpack it as much as we can. So there is a before creation introduction in verses 1 and 2, which reads, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. That's from the New, that's from the, uh, New American Standard Bible. Um, that's how it usually says. I'd like, I'd like to tweak it to go into the original Hebrew. Um, I would suggest that it probably could be, the, tra the Hebrew could be translated as the um, a common English Bible translates it, when God be began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was formless and void, and darkness grew over the surface of the deep, but, but whatever. We can work for whatever translation you like. Um, first, right off, we have to ask the question, what's for the water? There is water there before anything happened. The earth was formless and void, and this darkness was over the surface of the tehom in the Hebrew, which means the deep, the abyss. And the Spirit of God, the Ruach Elohim, was moving over the surface of the waters. So where did the water come from? Yeah. Creation has not yet begun. Creation will begin on the first day when God said, let there be light. Um, so, what's with the water? We're a little bit perplexed at the water because what we tend to do, pretty much everybody, is we know how the world was created, because science tells us how the world was created, and we tend to read it into the text of Genesis. But, if you believe that Genesis is the word of God, you're going to read what's actually there. If you don't like it, tough. You've got to deal with what's actually there. So it is a mistake to read in our scientific explanation into the text. Uh, we've got to read what's actually there and not what, which, what we wish was actually there. So what's with the water? Well, like I said, the word deep, uh, uh, is this explains the state of things before God began to create. Before it, the first thing was created, was light, and before that, um, the point is that everything was chaos and a mess before God began to create. And it's important to recognize that in the ancient world, such as, for example, the, the Enuma Elish and all the other, other uh, creation stories of the ancient Near East, it was understood that before God, or the gods, began to create, everything was sea. And we say, no, no, the seas were created later. As far as the ancients were concerned, before God or the gods began to create, everything was sea. We tend to think the sea is very nice. You know, John Macefield's sea fever, I must go down to the sea again, to the lonely sea and sky, and all I ask is a tall ship and a star to steer by. Isn't that nice? No ancient ever felt like that about the sea in the world. The sea for the ancients was chaos. The sea was the place of demons, the place of evil. Uh, it was the place where nothing could grow. Human life cannot exist on sea. So when, when the ancients were saying that before the earth was created, everything was sea, they were saying that everything was chaos. So for example, in the, uh, the Enuma Elish, the story of uh, the, cre uh, the Babylonian creation story, it, it says, when above the heaven had not yet been named, and below the earth had not yet been called by a name, when Apsu primeval there began to Mumu and, and Tiamat, she gave birth to them all, still mingled the waters together, at that time, the gods were created within them. So in this, let me unpack that a little bit. Apsu was the primordial sweetwater ocean. And in their understanding, Tiamat was the saltwater sea. And Mumu was the mist arising from them. So what it's saying is that before the heaven had been named, the earth below had been called by a name, we had the sweetwater ocean and the saltwater ocean and the mist arising from there all mingled their waters together. Everything was sea before then. There's another creation story that says, a holy house, a house of the gods in a holy place had not yet been made, a reed had not yet come forth, a tree had not been created, a brick had not been laid, all the lands were sea. And in Egypt, in, in Egypt the primeval sea, uh, called Nun, exists before anything else, so that their god Atum stands on a hill before he creates the world. So as far as the ancients were concerned, before creation took place, everything was sea. So you got to forget about 
uh, Carl Sagan and forget about National Geographic and forget about what your science teacher told you and listen to the story when it actually says the ancients would not have been surprised, the ancient Hebrews would not have been surprised that said before Elohim, before their God began to create, everything was sea. That was the chaos that preceded the creation of the world. That's where the water came from. Um, and it describes this uh, condition. This, this translation, the, the, the New American Standard says, it was formless and void. The Hebrew actually says it was tohu and bohu. So he says, what's, uh, what's tohu? Well, it, um, tohu doesn't sort of mean formless and void, like an empty, shapeless mass that's empty. If something's tohu, it means it's utterly useless, desolate, of no use to anybody. So you see how the Hebrew translates the word tohu in the rest of the Old Testament. Um, uh, in, the, in Deuteronomy 32, verse 10, it says that the howling wilderness was tohu. Why? Because it's useless. You can't live in the wilderness. It is it, uninhabitable. Or, so, or for example, idols which cannot save or profit were tohu. For, it's in 1 Samuel 12, 21. You, idols are useless. When you said they, they cannot save, they cannot help you, utterly useless. When uh, in Job 12, 24, when God caused his defeated foes to wander, they wandered in a trackless tohu, or trackless wilderness. So the, wild the wilderness is uninhabitable. But, um, and in Isaiah 45, verse 18, it says, when God made the earth, he did not make it to be tohu, but created it to be inhabited. Similarly, in Jeremiah 4, 23, God judged Judah by sending the Babylonian invaders, and the Babylonian invaders once again made the earth tohu and bohu, this is not a shapeless mass underwater, but a wilderness. Cities lay in ruins and were uninhabitable. So that's what tohu means. Tohu doesn't mean formless and void as we understand it. Tohu means useless, uninhabitable. So they are trying to say that before God began to create, nothing was any good to anybody. It's describing how desolate and useless things were before the God of the Hebrews came on the scene. But the God of the Hebrews did come on the scene. And it said that the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. The Hebrew is the Ruach Elohim. The word Spirit is the word Ruach, and Elohim is one of the Hebrew names for God. So what's the deal about Ruach? How do you, how do you translate Ruach? Well, the word can be translated as Spirit, like the Spirit that's inside you. If you're alive, you have Spirit inside you. It can be translated Breath, when you breathe, that's... Uh, that's Ruach. If it's a windy day, the wind that's blowing, the uh, straightening the flags, is also Ruach. So the word Ruach can, can mean breath, it can mean spirit, it can mean wind, and in fact it means all of these things together. You see all of the various nuances of the word Ruach in uh, Ezekiel 37, verses 8 to 10. Ezekiel 37 is the uh, division of the Valley of Dry Bones. Um, it's, it, it's chanted during the uh, uh, Holy Saturday Matins. And it is an image in Ezekiel of uh, uh, not so much individual people dying, but national extinction. Israel was about to go into exile. The nation was extinct. The nation was dead. It was never going to come back to life as far as anybody was concerned. How dead is it? It's like bones whitening and glistening in the sun. So you see this valley full of bones. And the prophet Ezekiel has said, Son of man, can these bones live? No. Can Israel hope to come back from the exile? Israel's hope is absolutely dead, except for God. God can bring life from the dead. God can bring Israel back from national extinction. So in, in, in Ezekiel's vision of the bones, he speaks to the bones and the bones come together. Uh, and so you have this uh, skeletal army and then it sees uh, flesh and sinews over all the bones. So you have all of these uh, people there, except that they're all corpses. They're all dead. And in Ezekiel is therefore told to prophesy to the Ruach. It says their bodies, their, their, their bodies had sinews and skin, but there was no Ruach in them. And then God said to me, prophesy to the Ruach, O son of man, and say to the Ruach, thus says the Lord God, come from the four, from the four Ruachs, O Ruach, and breathe upon these slain so that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the Ruach came into them, and they lived. So you see in this particular text all the four meanings, all the, the various three meanings of the word ruach. 
Ruach means wind, because he's prophesying to the, the wind. They come from the four winds, and they come into them. So now, now there is breath in them, uh, and, and spirit. Now they have life. So if you want to translate Ruach in English, you're, you're hooped. you got to pick. Is it going to translate it wind? Are you going to translate it a spirit? Are you going to translate it breath? What are you going to do? Uh, usually we kind of opt for both. In, in one of the, the, song, uh, the song, it said, uh, God uh, um, uh, uh, takes away their, their breath, they die and return to the dust. You send forth your spirit and they are created. It's the same way. You take away their ruach and they die and return to the dust. You send forth your ruach and they are created. Translates it breath and spirit because they're kind of, you're stuck with the difficulties of the English language. The Hebrew, you could use the word ruach, and it meant all three. So, I would suggest that in Genesis, you need all three meanings. Better to leave it untranslated a little bit. What was moving over the surface of the waters? God's breath, a wind from God, the spirit of God, the life-giving presence of God was moving over the waters. And if you want to translate it as ruach, then you can catch the richness of the entire uh, epic of the Old Testament. So that the Ruach Elohim uh, is, is present at the creation of the world. Um, after the world is flooded, and then in Noah's flood, and all is death, again, God sends a Ruach upon the waters, so that the, where the Ruach Elohim is present at the recreation of the world after the flood. And God also sends a Ruach to divide the waters of the Red Sea at the creation of the nation of Israel. Yeah, when you were thinking of the, the, uh, Moses dividing the waters, you all think of Charles and Heston, don't you? He gets this rod, puts it out of there, vroom, and all the waters go up there. Go, yeah. But the text is nothing of the kind. The text says Moses stretched out his staff over the waters of the Red Sea, and God sent a ruach that blew all night, separating the waters from the waters so that become a wall on, on either side. It was that ruach Elohim that was present in the, in the division of the Red Sea as well. So God sends his Ruach at the creation of the world, he sends his Ruach at the recreation of the world at Noah, he sends his Ruach uh, for the creation of the state, of the nation of Israel. Then when Israel became a, a people as they transferred through the Red Sea. If you're gonna translate what one is wind and one is as spirit, you can do that, but you miss the richness. You miss what the text is actually saying. And how the Ruach Elohim is the life of God that gives creation to the world, to the recreated world, and to his newly created people, Israel. That's the Ruach Elohim that was breathing uh, uh, and, uh, um, and hovering over, over the waters. So that's the beginning, that's the, in, that's the introit. When God began to create the heavens and the earth, everything was a mess, it was no use until the God of Israel came on the scene with a, with a Ruach Elohim, hovering in anticipation, as it were, over the surface of the waters. And then, day one of creation. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, one day. Um, you'll note that, it, it, again, if you compare it to the culture of its time, when the other gods began to create, they did it through um, a uh, number of ways. They, they did it through sexual generation, uh, creating little gods who created other little gods. Uh, they created through gods fighting it out. When God was fighting with another god and sliced him in half, and like I said before, used one half of the sky and one half of the earth. Um, so there was all sorts of conflict. There was, a, there, was a, there was adventure. There was sex. There was other stuff that I won't mention just in case this is being recorded. But at any rate, I'm, 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 but, but the, the Hebrew narrative is, is different. God is sovereign. God doesn't fight with rivals. Elohim has no rivals. He, with a mere two words in the Hebrew. In English, it's more. Let there be light. In the Hebrew, it's two words. Light exists. It's not elegant poetry, but there are two mere words. God merely speaks, and light obediently uh, uh, comes into being. Um, and, the, and once again, we kind of don't miss the fact that it is, it is the God of the Hebrews that is doing the creation. It is the Ruach Elohim. Elohim is not, it doesn't just mean God in general. It means in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the sweep of the Old Testament narrative, it means the God of the Hebrews. It's called Elohim, sometimes it's called Yahweh, sometimes you have the composite Yahweh Elohim. But it's the God of the Hebrews that creates the light. Marduk is nowhere in sight. 
All the other gods, the gods of the Egyptians, the gods of the Assyrians, all the, they're losers. They have nothing to say. They did not create the world. They did not sustain the world. They did not run the world. The God of the Hebrews is one that created and, 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 and sustains the world. Um, so you'll note that what is being created is night and day. That again, if you're going to try to read in our science, uh, you want to say, okay, it starts with a big bang. And it, it was in the movie uh, Noah. <coughs> you see the movie Noah? The, but it was kind of a, one of the dumber movies around, but never mind. But it's okay. Uh, nice acting. Um, and they're, they're telling the story of creation. It said, let there be light, boom, and there's the big bang. You know? So the, again, you're trying to read our science back into the text. Don't do that. It's the word of God. Let it say what it wants to say. Don't read Carl Sagan into Genesis. And so what was created, you know what was created, because it, it gives it a name, day. And the darkness that was separated from was called night. In other words, what God is creating is time. The, the, the daylight that we see at the, on the horizon before, before the sun comes up, there, you can see daylight there. That's what God is creating. Every day, every time we, we rise, we see daylight separating it from the darkness. A new day is upon us. That's the creation of God. God is creating, not the Big Bang. The text tells you what God is creating. He was creating day and separating it uh, from night. And you'll note that it gives it a name. Through all of the text, it says that God creates this and he gives it a name. You'll notice in the, in the ancient world, Nothing was really finished, uh, nothing was really created. Creation was not finished until it had a name. Because creation didn't just refer to something that physically existed somewhere, it, it referred to something that was of use to civilization. It was anthropocentric, it was of use to man. So therefore, it's got to have a name, which is to say it's got to have a place and a utility for man to be really created. The, tech, the work of creation is not finished until it has a name and a function in human society. So we know, for example, in the Enuma Elish, when it was talking about the sea, it began by saying, when the heaven above had not been named, and below the earth had not been called by a name, or as we would say, created. So everything is not simply created, it's given a name because it, was, it functions in human society, that it was to say it was created for us. Not just for the angels, it was, the, it was a, a extreme anthropocentric view of creation. God loves us. The God of Israel created the world for humanity. Um, uh, it also says that God stepped back from his work and saw that the light was good. Hebrew word for good is the word tov. Uh, tov doesn't mean good in the sense of morally good uh, or beautiful or something like this. Tov means um, uh, that uh, it was able to fulfill the purpose for which it was made. So, for example, a vacuum cleaner, if it does not suck, if it does not vacuum up stuff, it's not tov. It's like it turned into a really nice planter or doorstop. Okay, yeah, but it's still, but it's not tov because a vacuum cleaner was made to suck and to vacuum up stuff. And if it doesn't do that, it does not fulfill the function for which it was made. It's not tov. So that's what God is saying, that the, the time, daylight was created to... Uh, enable other things to happen, and it does that just fine. But God made these things to fulfill their function. God looks at it and says, yep, it works just fine. It is good, it is tov. That's the first day. <clears throat> Chapter 1, verses 6 to 8. Then God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse, and separated the waters which were below the expanse, from the waters which were above the expanse, and it was so. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning, a second day. So again, we got to remember, let the text say what it says. We want to read into it our science. Don't do that. Remember what the text said. The text said before, everything was dark, and everything was sea. Everything was water, and then God turned the lights on, essentially created daylight. And now step two on the second day is God creates uh, rakia in the Hebrew word. Uh, this translates it expanse. The King James translates it firmament uh, to separate the waters that are above the waters. So you got everything's water, and it was uh, everything's seawater, in fact. And so the expanse separates the water, pushes it up here, and everything's water down below. Um, so that 
The sky is solid. The rakia comes from the Hebrew word uh, raka, meaning to hammer. So the same word used in Exodus 39, verse 3, to describe the hammering out of the gold plate uh, for use in the tabernacle. So it's understood that it, the God makes the expanse, he makes the rakia, he makes the firmament, something solid to keep the water up there from coming down here. We say, but, but the sky isn't solid. Listen to what the text says. The text says the sky is solid. We can figure out what we're going to do with that later on. But the ancients thought that the sky was solid. And that's why it's translated to this word, Hebrew word rakia is translated in the, in the Greek Septuagint as stereoma. Comes from the Greek word stereos, meaning firm. And so you see, for example, uh, that the ancients thought that the sky was solid in Hebrew in Ezekiel 1, 22 and following. There's a vision of God's throne, and it's the, 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 the throne is supported by the rakia. The rakia, the firmament, has to be solid enough to support God's throne. In a, a different Hebrew word is used in Job 37, verse 18. It says, the heaven or the sky is hard as a molten mirror. So you have the, the I have to understand that before everything was seawater, now God's made the solid sky to keep the water up there and the water down here. The ancients assumed that there was a, a celestial sea up there. You say, why is the sky blue? They would say the sky is blue for the same reason that the sea is blue, because it's a sea. And they talked about the, the rain came down when the when the, uh, the windows of heaven opened. You say, where does the rain come from? There's, there's sea up there, and the windows open, and that's where the sky, that's where, that's where the rain comes from. You say, yeah, but that's not where the rain comes from. They, as I said, they had a different cosmology than we do. They had no problem with saying in Job 37, verse 18, that the sky is hard as a molten mirror. That's the cosmology that they had. You know, there is no, no repetition of it was tov in this text because it is of no use to us. Then, day three comes. Then God said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, see it as a name, and the gathering of the waters he called seas. Again, another name. And God saw that it was tov. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation and plants yielding seed, fruit trees on the earth bearing fruit after their kind with seed in them. And it was so. And the earth brought forth vegetation and plants yielding seed after their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind. And God saw that it was tov, it was good, worked just fine. And there was evening and there was morning, a third day. So now we start to get the world that we knew. Before everything was sea, then the solid sky pushed the waters up there. And now God's gathering all the waters below, because everything's, everything's sea, into one place so the dry land appears and, and um, can sprout vegetation. And it, had, and it makes a point of saying that it sprouts vegetation after its kind. And you need to know this because if you're a farmer and you want to grow stuff, you got to realize that the seed that you put in is what you're going to get back out. If you plant wheat, you will not get crabgrass. If you plant wheat, you get wheat. So in other words, God is creating agriculture on, on the third day. And it was told because agriculture works just fine. Then in day four, then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of, of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let, the, let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth, and it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to govern the day, and the lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also. And God placed them in the firmament of the heavens to give light to the earth, to govern the day and the night, to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, a fourth day. So you'll note that the sun and the moon and the stars were created on um, on the fourth day after there was light. God said, let there be light, and then comes the sun and the moon later on. And a number of people have looked at that and thought, hmm, what's going on? What's going on is that you're reading a very old document written in the Bronze Age with the cosmology that presupposed what they could see. What they could see is when you get up in the morning, there's light, there's daylight, before the sun comes up. So as far as they were concerned, they were separate. And you'll note too, that when it, it talks about the sun and the moon, they're perfectly good Hebrew words for sun and moon, it doesn't use them. Because it wants to avoid the impression that God is creating another set of gods. Because in the ancient um, uh, 
pagan cosmologies. One god would create a couple of other gods, who would create a couple of other gods and stuff like this. And the ancients thought that the sun and the moon were gods. So they didn't want to give the impression that, oh, God's creating these two other gods. No, the sun and the moon are not gods, they're just lamps. You got lamps in your home, this is all that they are. It doesn't mention their names, it just says it is the big light to govern the day and the littler light to govern the night. And you'll note that it, it kind of gives short shrift to the stars. It talks not about the sun and the moon, it just says, according to this English translation, he made the stars also. Um, it's actually just two words in the Hebrew. Uh, stars too. It's almost like it's a little footnote. Why? Because the ancients were really keen on astrology. They thought they, the stars governed uh, and ruled. The stars were gods and they would govern what all that happens down here. And the Hebrews thought that's malarkey in all sorts of ways. Forget about astrology. So I just want to dip it. it it sweeps astrology off the table, as it were, by scarcely mentioning the stars. He made the sun and the moon, and he made them for us. The whole point about saying that they were made um, for signs and seasons and for days and years means for a festal calendar. Because the Hebrews had a lunar calendar. You would have certain feasts and sacrifices on uh, on the new moon. You would come from the full moon and stuff like this. It had a lunar calendar. So it's saying God made the sun and the moon so that the Israel, and in fact, all the, all the peoples of the earth could, could know and have a, a functioning religion. You needed a calendar to know when to have the feasts, and that's what was going on. God made the sun and the stars for us to give light to the earth. Again, it's entirely anthropocentric. God made the sun and the moon for us. If you're you know, on, the, on the planet uh, Alpha Centauri or something like that, you could say, what about us? Okay, whatever. Forget Alpha Centauri. This is talking about the people... That, that know Yahweh Elohim. So that's the, uh, the creation of the sun and the moon, and finally we have footnote, the stars as well. And then on day five, then God said, let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures, and let the birds fly in the earth in the open firmament of the heavens. And God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarmed after their kind, and every winged bird after its kind, and God saw that it was Tov. And God blessed them and saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, a fifth day. You need to know a little bit of the Hebrew. When it says uh, every living creature, it's, it's literally every living soul, every nefesh hayah. So we tend to use the word soul to say the part of man that, dip, that differentiates us from the animals. Uh, men have souls. Uh, animals who have souls. That's another discussion that we'll, we will not have now. But, but the point is, they're trying to say, when they, when they try to say man is a soul and animals do not have souls, what they're trying to say is man is fundamentally different, different in kind, not just in degree than the animals. Fair enough. But that's not what, what the Hebrew word means. The word Hebrew word nefesh, usually translated soul, just means a being. Something that, a nefesh hayah, a, a living soul, is something that feels and moves and walks. That's what it means, and, and breathes, possibly. So God made the waters teeming with swarms of Nefeshaya and the birds in the air, too. And then this translation says, God made the great sea creatures. The word sea, or, or sea monsters. The word sea monster is the word tenani, a chaos creature. And once again, you gotta forget about your zoology that you learned in high school. Um, for us, all, all animals are kind of the same and kind of equal. Some are big, some are small, um, some are a little dangerous, uh, and, but they're all just kind of the same animals. So you, you got fish, and then you got big fish like sharks, and then you got real big fish like whales or sea monsters. But essentially, you know, the, the Loch Ness monster is just simply a big fish for us. Zoologically speaking, uh, has no more mystic significance unless you're making a documentary and trying to do Scottish tourism. Than, 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 than anything else. But it was different with the ancients. The Tananim were chaos creatures. They were creatures that lived on the edge. People noticed that when, when things turned to Tohu and Bohu, when they became uninhabitable, uh, when things returned to chaos, uh, owls would come out, snakes would come out. You know, they're the, um, the things that, we, that you never saw in, in, the, in, in the city when there was life and were things going off, they kind of came out. They were chaos creatures. And the Tananim was a chaos creature. The most famous of the Tananim was, of course, Leviathan. 
a uh, little bit like, like Nessie, I suppose, uh, but it's a terrible creature. It is in Job, Job 41, verse 34, said it is king over all the sons of, of, of pride. And there's a big long description in Job about how terrible it is, you know, fire breathing and all, all, of, all, of, this, all of this sort of thing. So um, it's, as far as the, the Tananim were rivals of God, and in some mythologies, the God would slay the Tananim, would slay Leviathan. Some of the mythology turns up in, the, in Isaiah and some, and some of the Psalms as well. But the idea of the, of the Tananim were rivals to God in order to establish his, his sovereignty. God has to slay the Tananim. But not here. Here makes the point, God created the Tananim. He, they were, God, the, the Tananim were not rivals to God because God has no rivals. And you see this in, in, um, in uh, Psalm 104, verse 26 as well. God made Leviathan to sport in the waters. Leviathan, the terrible Tananim, the chaos creature, the uh, uh, liminal animal that lives on the edges of creation is just God's pet. It, it frolics in the water just like anything else. This is an, an, an assertion of God's total and complete sovereignty over all of, all of the world. The world that God made had no dark edges in it. It was all filled by, with God's light. It was all made uh, through God's love. And then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters of the sea. Uh, we tend to use the word bless in a, in a very spiritual meaning, you know. You know have a blessed day, you know, or if you ask the bishop for a blessing, sometimes you'll do that, or probably that, with two hands. Um, but, uh, and that's, 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 that's fine, but it has to be understood that in the Hebrew, the word uh, blessing, baraka, usually it's something to do with sex. If your animals, if your sheep were blessed, they produced lots of little lambs. If your cows were blessed, they produced lots of little calves, you know. If your horses were blessed, lots of ponies, whatever. If your children were blessed, you, you, they had you know, sons and daughters. And then that's it, probably, mostly sons, probably. Sorry, but that's not a lot. So the point is, blessing had to do with, uh, with fecundity, it had to do with fertility, had to do with uh, virility, and, and, and lots, of, lots, of, lots, of, uh, lots of little animals created. So you notice when it says that God blessed them, um, what, what it's saying is God is bestowing upon them the, the power of fertility so that they would be fruitful and multiply so much that they would fill the waters of the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. Then things got really wonderful on the last day of creation, day six. Then God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, nefeshaya, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth after their kind. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth after their kind and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind. And God saw that it was good. So before he made uh, the, um, the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, now the earth uh, spontaneously brings forth living creatures, just as the seas spontaneously brought forth fish, um, and it creeps after its kind, so that if you're going to be a farmer and you're going to have uh, um, uh, your cows, when the cows have babies, they're not going to have sheep, they're going to have cows. You can, you, can, you can count on that. And then after all of the animals are created, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which is fruit yielding seed, it shall be as food for you. And every beast of the earth, and every bird of the sky, and everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very tov. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. So let's begin to unpack it a little bit. Um, first, God made the animals, and then God made man. So that the, the man, or mankind, is the culmination and crown, uh, the consummation of God's creation. God made the kingdom, and then the king and queen come to rule it. That's why it is... The creation of man is narrated last. 
because man is the king of creation. First, you have everything ready for man, as, as to where the throne is prepared, with the world in which you have to rule, and then comes the king and the queen to rule it. And you need to look at the, uh, the Hebrew maybe a little bit. What it says in the Hebrew is, God said, let us make Adam in our Salem, and according to our Demuth. The word for man is the, is the Hebrew word Adam. If you're going to translate it one as a proper name and the other as, as man, you miss what it's saying a little bit. Uh, Adam is, you could say it's a name for mankind, but it's, it's all, it means any, any man of either gender is Adam. And it said that he was made uh, in God's own Salem, God's own image. So what's a Salem? Um, again, later on, the fathers would say, would, would meditate upon what makes, what makes mankind different than the animals you know what and talk about in terms of the image of god so the image of god is it is it about our freedom is it about our uh is it about our reason and our rationality is it about our capacity for love and self-transcendence what is it so you know, that's a that's a good discussion but that's not what selem means in the original hebrew here selem is the nor is the normal word used for image so for example if you went into a pagan temple you would see a selem there of the god if, they get the, if you're in Marduk's temple, there would be a Salem, an image of, of Marduk. And it was understood that the Salem, or the image, was not a statue of an absent god. It was how the god Marduk, or whoever, was, was present in the world. Marduk was present and ruled, and did whatever Marduk does, through his Salem. What you do to his Salem, you do to him. That's what a Salem is. That's how the word, that's how the word functions. So what's going on is that God is saying, to the Adam, to the male and the female, to the man and the woman, you are my Salem, you are my vice regent. I rule the creation through you. That's why, if you read the text carefully, it said, let us make man in our Salem and let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, and the cattle, and, and all the earth. Um, and so, in order to rule the earth, God blessed them. Barak is the, is the, is the, is the Hebrew, it said once again, has to do with fecundity, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and rule. So you get this man as the image of God in Psalm 8, for example. It said, what is man that you think of him and the, and the son of man that you that you care for him? You will put all things under his feet. And it mentions the, the, the creation again. Man is the image of God, he is the vice region of God. God rules the earth through man and woman through his vice region. This was absolutely revolutionary in the ancient world. It was understood by the ancients that the king uh, might be in the image of God. The king, God would rule, the gods of Egypt would rule Egypt through the pharaoh as the king, but the common Egyptian man, and even more the common Egyptian woman, was not in the image of God. It was not, God didn't rule through them. The common man was just essentially disposable ballast. Uh, and when women were chattel. So you can, you get, they, they, it was only the king that might be in the in the Salem, in the image of God. But this text says, no, it is not just the king, it is the common labor in the field. Every person that walks the earth, from the king to the common guy, slugging it out and carrying away the garbage and working the field and doing stuff, and his wife are both kings and queens of creation. Yet this is the democratization of the image of God. It is absolutely revolutionary. There's nothing like it in the ancient world. Before, uh, like I said, men were disposable, um, have, have little value, unless you were very rich. Um, but this says, regardless of your wealth, and even regardless of your gender, you are in the image of God. So this is a lesson from Genesis that we have not yet learned. The value of the common man, we have not yet learned. We'll talk more about this in a minute. The common, the, uh, the women, uh, the value of women, we have not yet learned. Well, we have uh, the pandemic of pornography, we're going to treat it as a commodity to be sold. We have not yet learned that women and men are both in the, are the are both the salam of Elohim, the image of, of God. So um, that's what's going on. One other question about what is why why the plural? Let us make man in our image. And it's not the plural of majesty. You know, like Queen was Victoria might have said, we are not amused, you know, that sort of stuff. But this is, you, you don't find this in the Hebrew scriptures. Why, 
the plural is used. Well, if you're going to dig a little closer, dig a little deeper, and look at a Christotelic meaning, then you can talk about the Trinity. And that's fair enough. But before you get to the Christotelic meaning, before you get dig, dig deep using uh, Christology, you've got to say, what did it mean to its original hearers? And the plural was a reference to God's counsel. We would say God's counsel of angels. It was understood by the ancients that all gods were part of the pantheon. There was a council of gods. Of course, in monotheistic Israel, there is only one god, so you can't have a pantheon of gods, but God still has a council of angels that he consults with. That was uh, the understanding throughout the rest of the Old Testament. For example, I won't read the whole text, but in 1 Kings 22, God's trying to figure out what to do with the king of Israel, and he says, what should I do? And he asks his angels, and one of the angels comes up and says, I have an idea, I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of the king. So, okay, so, and God says, okay, do that. Now, it's, it's an image, it's trying to make a point, and it's using, it's making the point through the cultural commonplaces of that particular day. The idea that if, if God is a king, then he must have a court, because all kings have a court. A king without a court is no king. So God has a court, it's the court of angels, and that's the image. But one, one, one will say that's the metaphor and the parable, if, if, you want, if you want to put it like that. So if that's, for example, you see in the Psalter as well, Psalm 89, verse 5, Yahweh is praised in the assembly of the holy ones. That's the divine counsel. In, in Isaiah 14, verse 13, God's home is called the Mount of Assembly, because that's where all the other angels assemble. Psalm 29, verse 1, talks about the angels as sons of God, as B'nai Elim, ascribing to God glory and strength. Uh, it's same with the, the call of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6. Who will go for us? You know, it, it, the Septuagint is a little nervous about that, and they, and they sandpaper the Hebrew away to make it a little more acceptable to a later audience, because they say, sounds like paganism. No, it's not paganism, it's the divine council. But the Septuagint came at a, a later stage of development when you had to worry about stuff like that. Um, so that's what it is a reference to. With, with man's creation, the creation of the Adam in both male and female, was so important that instead of God just, just doing it, he says, okay, let us create man. You, you're watching this, this is going to be, this is going to be, going to be spectacular. It is the reference to the um, God's counsel shows the importance of the creation of the Adam. This is God is making the king and the queen to rule of all creation, and there is the drama attending that moment of creation. Then, day seven, from Genesis 2, verses 1 to 4. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed, and all their hosts, literally all their armies. By the seventh day, God completed his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because he rested from all his works which he had created and made. This says, this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that um, Yahweh Elohim made heaven and earth. Literally in the Greek, in the, in the Hebrew, this is, these are the toldoth, these are the generations, the family histories. Um, so you'll note that after God creates um, the heaven and the earth and everything in it, he rests. Now, we kind of, kind of miss this because again, we don't appreciate the cultural uh, commonplaces of the day. For us, God's rest is saying, I've done that. That's, good. Yeah. That's a lot of work. Here's a decent chair. You know? Or it's like you're you're working on your construction site and you finish your work and so you go home and rest. You know, you drop your shovel, leave the construction site, God goes back to heaven, whatever, that sort of stuff. God rests, he stops working. But but when you understand what was going on in those days when the gods created the world, they entered they rested by entering into their temples that had been made, entering into their sanctuary, and from there, running the world. That was a cultural commonplace. So for example, in the Enuma Elish, God says, come, let us make something whose name should be called the sanctuary, that's the temple, it shall be a dwelling for our rest at night. Come, let us repose therein, let us erect a throne dice. On the day that we arrive, we will repose in it. So what this text is saying, it's not just talking about God walking away from the work site. It's saying that the, the, the cosmos is the cosmic temple where God rests. God doesn't dwell in temples made by hands. He dwells in the cosmos that he has made. God's glory fills heaven and earth. The world is sacred because God made it. The world is sacred because it is 
the uh, uh, cosmos temple in which in which God lives and God moves and from which God <coughs> runs the earth. So, question is, what are what are the lessons in Genesis? The lessons do not tell us the mechanism by which God created the world. We, we're all keen about that. And you say, are we going to teach Genesis in, in school, in science? Because for us, it's all about the mechanism. How did, the, how did God create? Did God make it in, in six days? Were the days 24 hours? Was it by evolution? We want to know the mechanism. But that was not the question that they were answering. Um, they were answering, what is the significance of the things that are here? If you think that, God, that the, the story is primarily teaching about the scientific, mechanical uh, machine that God, that God created, then you got some problems. You have to explain, if you're going to take Genesis to be a literal historical account, you have to explain why there's water before God began to create on the first day. Do you really think that the sky is solid? Uh, and you have to explain, do you really think that the earth was sprouting vegetation and seeds and flowers before the creation of the sun and the moon. How does photosynthesis work again? So, and if, and if, you, if you believe that, I, <laughs> there you go. But I would suggest that that's not the message of Genesis. Genesis was never given primarily to teach us the mechanism by which God created the world. It was meant to teach at least six other lessons that I'll mention kind of briefly. First of all, creation is by divine plan. It is not random, and it is not by chance. Sometimes you get a discussion when someone says, is there intelligent life elsewhere in the universe? Uh, presuppose that there's intelligent life here on Earth. But that <laughs> <laughs> is, there, is there intelligent life somewhere else in the universe? Oh, there must be, because it's so vast, and how could you imagine that it could only happen here What Surely if it happened here, it must have happened someplace else because the universe is so vast. Okay, but that argument presupposes that it happened by chance. And if it happened by chance, I said once, it would probably happen again if the, if the universe is big enough. But in fact, the universe was not created randomly or by chance. It was created by God's design. Created because God said, let there be light. He wanted to make the world for us. So if, if there's intelligent life elsewhere in the universe, if God said, let there be light someplace else. If God wants to create another planet with, it, with, the, with the intelligent light, I guess he can do so. But if he didn't, then it didn't take place. So that we, we are here because we are made by God. Every animal was made by God. Every baby was made by God. Say, so use, use mommy and daddy. Yes, but he was made by God. So that every baby is made in the Salem uh, of, of Elohim. He's made in God's image. And every child is adorned, even in the womb, with God's image. We each have a dignity that, that is un, un, unheard of. If we came here just by chance, then we're just very clever animals in clothes. Uh, but as a matter of fact, we are not just very clever animals in clothes. We are made in the image of God. Uh, come back to that just a little bit. And that means that therefore, because um, it, it described the, the creation in an anthropocentric way, God made the stars uh, and God made that the, the heaven and the, um, God made the sun and the moon for us. It's, it's for our perspective. Um, that means that creation is God's gift to us. When we look at what we see, what God has made, this is God's gift. And therefore, the proper response is, is twofold. One, don't mess it up, because God made it. You know, if I, if I give you my property, don't wreck it, because it doesn't belong to you, it belongs to me. Don't wreck it, you're just on loan. In the same way, don't wreck the creation. Don't pollute, don't uh, hunt animals to extinction just because you want ivory. Uh, uh, don't mess with the ozone layer because it's not your ozone layer, it's God's ozone layer. He made it, treat it nice because it doesn't belong to you, it belongs to God. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that because God made all of these things, the proper response is gratitude. For every glass of wine, every bar of chocolate, every child's smile, every time it rains, there's a drought every time it's sun because it's so nice the proper response is glory to you for all things we get up in the morning as soon as you see the sun you say yes there's the there's the daylight it's tov god made it glory to you uh, who have shown us the light which is how what you see in the monastery you're praying matins all through the night and when the sun peeks over the horizon you get you give glory to god for it because god made it the proper response to realizing that god made everything is 
humility, and gratitude. And the third uh, lesson, I'm running through these quick, so there'll be time for questions, is that humanity bears the image of God, and so human beings are worth something regardless of our social utility. You can say, if you get, if you, some people have no social utility. If you get, if I get to be 95, I will probably have no social utility whatsoever. I will no longer be ornamental, assuming that I'm ornamental now, um, and I will not be able to write books, shovel snow, club, you know, cook, whatever. I will be a fairly uh, useless individual. Uh, I will have very little social utility. Tough. I'm still valuable because I'm made in the image of God. God's image does not depend upon our social utility. That's the problem with what's politely called medical assisted dying. You know, it, is, it assumes that if you have no medical, if, if you have no social utility, then it's okay to get rid of you. Nope, you are still made in the image of God. You have value because God made you. Regardless of how smart you are, regardless of how dumb you are, regardless of how rich or, or poor, regardless of whether you're important or utterly unknown, you still have value, you are still a God's salem. It is your the, the vice God rules the world through mankind that includes everybody. No exceptions. And fourthly, which I possibly should have made um, uh, firstly, uh, male and female are of equal worth since both are jointly made in God's image to rule the world. And I mentioned this before that this is, if it is revolutionary to democratize the image of God and to say not just the king, but um, all men are created in the image of God. It's even more revolutionary to say, by, by the way, all men includes all women as well. Um, so that is, like I said, in, in the ancient world, uh, women were essentially chattel. If you're rich, you can have five camels, you're going to have five wives, you can have whatever. Polygamy, where it, which was in very many places the norm, testified to the devaluation of women throughout, throughout the world. So they don't get it. They are, they are both of equal worth because they are equally made in the image of God. God made Adam in his image. In the image of God, he made them male and female. He made them. Both, in, both men and women are Adam and both in the, in the image of God, jointly ruling his world. And number five, which you probably should put in capital letters, gender is binary. There are two genders. There are only two genders, male and female. There aren't 63, and you don't get to choose. Sometimes, once in a while, through unfortunate things, you have um, cases of hermaphroditism or intersex or something that, that a, a, a condition that a doctor can see. A doctor can say, aha. So, okay, but, but short of the doctors, oh my goodness, aha. Then, then you, the, you, your gender can be determined uh, very, very quickly with a mirror. That's why the nurses, when someone's born, the nurses don't have to. Uh, uh, spend a lot of time figuring out if it's a boy or a girl. You just look down in the appropriate space and say, congratulations, Mrs. Smith, it's a baby girl. Congratulations, Mrs. Jones, it's a baby girl. You know, the nurse is not prophesying about their gender roles. <laughs> They're just saying, that's the gender, all things being equal, that God gave you. And it generally brings with you a set of expectations as, as well. The idea that gender is fluid, or that gender is subjective, or that gender can be chosen more or less at whim, is demonic. It comes from the other side, and, it, and it, if you, if this, if this ideology is allowed to take root and to grow and to thrive and to determine our, 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 our culture, it will destroy us eventually, because it eats at the very foundation of what it means to be a family, what it means to be uh, a man and a woman. It exalts uh, the sovereignty of the human will above practically everything else. Longer sermon than I possibly intended to give, but it's important to recognize that gender is binary, male or female, he made them. That's tov. Anything else is dramatically not tov. And finally, as I mentioned before, the world is God's temple, and we live, it, live in it as his priests, both male and female, the priesthood of all peoples, as we respect its sanctity. We'll look at that a little bit in there second creation story, but if the world is God's cosmic temple, we who live in it are therefore his priests. Men, men and women are together, uh, God's priests caring for the temple that he has made, and, and taking care of it, and honoring him, and worshiping the Lord of the temple. These I suggest, these six lessons, are the real lessons of Genesis, and they are more important for us to know those lessons than to figure out, how do we get here again? 
because that doesn't help you live. What you need to know is that we are different from the animals, that we have, that we have value, that we are meant to live in the world that God created with respect and gratitude. And when, you, when you listen to what Genesis is really saying, it tells you how you live when you get out of bed in the morning. You live as God's priest, you live as God's child, you live respecting the people around you because they, as well as you, are made in the image of God. Thank you, God bless you. Are there happy to take any, any, any questions if there, if there are?